Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Rafael Ortega. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Multicultural Affairs here in the medical school. And on this occasion, we have invited not just individuals from the medical school, but those from the School of Dental Medicine, School of Public Health, GMS, and the hospital. This is a very uh, large, heterogeneous, and complex medical campus. Uh, the mission and the vision of the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affair, Affairs is to serve as proponents for diversity and cultural competence on the medical campus through collaboration with every department. We do our best to foster an environment that demonstrates our belief that diversity adds value to intellectual development, academic discourse, patient care, and research. We believe that diversity is essential to the development of future leaders in our community, our nation, and indeed throughout the world. As a medical school, we train physicians, and one can review the two basic functions of a physician into two parts. Number one, to make a diagnosis, and number two, to establish appropriate treatment. But that's really easier said than, uh, than done, because these functions are carried out in the context of culture, ethnicity, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, and frequently a different language, among many other characteristics. We aim to prepare physicians and healthcare providers that are culturally competent to care for the multi-ethnic patient population that we see every day in our hospital. But in order to sustain this environment of openness and inclusion, it is criti critically important to have conversations such as the one that we're having tonight. This is not the first time. In the past, we've had similar panel discussions addressing Hispanics, Jews, blacks, Asians, South Asians, LGBT individuals, individuals with disabilities, Muslims, and other groups represented on our medical campus. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Alex Norbash, who is now the chair at UCSD in radiology. Uh, he was the chair here and was an assistant dean in our Office of Diversity, and he was our main advisor, my consigliere, if you will, on Islamic affairs. And Alex truly personified respect, generosity, and humility, and I miss him sorely because of his honesty and openness, and I wish he were here tonight. Uh, indeed, Muslims form part of our fabric, and they are prominently featured in our publications, in our videos, and on our website. Now, considering recent events, it is timely to have this conversation to allow the free expression of the challenges, the successes, and the opportunities for improvement in our environment regarding Muslim issues. We might be tempted, though, to discuss theology or politics, history, or other fascinating topics related to Islam. However, on this occasion, the context of the conversation will be secular, bearing in mind the often quoted phrase, to think globally and act locally. We should not disregard current events, but the central question here are, uh, what can we do on the medical campus to better understand Muslims and to strengthen and appreciate the contributions they make in our community? What will be the main topic of the conversation? I, I don't know. It depends on the questions that we ask, right? But I submit to you that more important than the topic itself is to have the conversation. So in a way, the conversation is the topic. Uh, last week, I asked a medical student in his fourth year if he knew any Muslims in his class. I was trying to recruit people to come and to help me out. And he replied that he thought a classmate with whom he had interacted with in the classroom, in the clinical setting and on social occasions, was a Muslim, but that he was not sure. Uh, and I wonder how was it possible that two classmates, almost finishing medical school, didn't know about their respective cultures and religions how are we, in my office, to identify individuals that could help us in our diversity efforts unless those individuals are confident and comfortable enough to openly express their unique identity and for us to inquire about it? So we really need individuals from all walks of life to help us tackle the research and clinical challenges that we face in order to be the best we can be. And we encourage the audience, you, to share your thoughts regarding what Muslims can do to foster greater openness and understanding. I would like now to introduce our panelists, which I myself chose, three of them because they're my friends, <laughs> and Ali because I met him recently, and uh, 
So he's a great guy. So uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I have uh, a certain latitude uh, to ask a lot of questions because I know them uh, and, I, and they know me. First, I'd like to introduce Sadia Shamin, uh, who is one of our anesthesia residents in the Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, Dr. Aligar Massey, uh, who is in the Department of Radiology, and Amir Ali from the School of Dental Medicine, and Sharuk Yalizi, whom I've known for a long time. Uh, th those are our panelists, and, and I would now like to ask them to take 60 seconds each. We're going to begin with Ali, uh, so that they can give a, a short summary of where they're coming from and what they're doing here. Ali. Um. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Rafael, for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I do have to, um, on behalf of uh, my colleagues here, thank also the university for the opportunity, because it's not every day that we have this opportunity to talk as, uh, as freely as we, we will do tonight. So please ask any question you want, because it's, it's free. Um, my name is Ali Gormazi. Um, uh, Gormazi is actually red in Turkish. So my family background is Turkish, but I was born in Tunisia. I'm an Arab Muslim. Uh, I came uh, after 26 years. I uh, um, t uh, crossed actually Mediterranean. I went to Paris. I did my uh, residency in radiology. Uh, went through all the steps to uh, associate professor or praticien hospitalier. And then at some point, I, uh, I came to the U.S. for opportunities. Um, in San Francisco, I, do, I did actually five years and, uh, and a half research. And uh, one day, I ended up in Boston University. It has been now almost nine years, in few days. And I'm uh, very happy to be here, always glad to, uh, to serve uh, minorities and um, underserved uh, population. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Sharuk Jalisi, and uh, thank you, Rafael. It says on, but I don't know if it's yeah, working. Okay. But anyway, uh, thank you, Rafael and the Boston University for uh, having this conversation. I think it's very important, as Ali said, I think it's important for anyone to ask any question you have on your mind uh, to, to, to move the conversation along. Uh, I uh, was born and raised in Pakistan, uh, which is obviously in the media a lot nowadays. Uh, and I came here for, uh, for, medical, for undergrad and medical school as a seven-year medical student, uh, an international student. Uh, during the course, I did get, uh, became an immigrant and uh, stayed on with my green card and then ultimately did my medical school and then residency training in otorengology at Boston University. I did go away, away to Vanderbilt University to do a fellowship in uh, skull base surgery, microvascular, and head and neck surgery, and then came back to Boston University to build the head and neck services over here and have uh, just finished uh, 10 years, a decade, at Boston University. Uh, during the time, I've done uh, many other things, uh, president of the Massachusetts Society of Otorengology, I've uh, run the Pakistan Association of Greater Boston, uh, and I think I've uh, made great friends, and it's been a great uh, community to be working in uh, Boston and beyond. Um, I work on national level with the American Academy of Otorengology and American Head and Neck Society. Um, so, you know, it's been a good thing. We uh, continue to uh, 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 work with friends and uh, not friends, uh, but uh, that's what I have done. So I'm an immigrant uh, uh, raised in Pakistan and now in the United States and an American Muslim, I should say. <laughs> Sadia. Hello, all. Thank you for coming. My name is Sadia Shamim. I'm one of the anesthesiology residents here, and I'd like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues in thanking Dr. Ortega for arranging this and also for Boston University for allowing us to host this discussion. And I do encourage questions now and always, and I've always encouraged it. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia. I grew up there, completed education there. I also um, completed education here in the U.S. and in Austria. I went back home to Pakistan for medical school, and I've come back to the U.S. for residency. I'm currently in my third year here, and I'm currently in the process of being an immigrant. So I'm very excited about that, and I'm excited to be here. Okay. Amr? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Amr Ali. Uh, I don't have as interesting of a story as the other people before me. Um, so I'm a third year dental student uh, here at the Golden School of Dental Medicine. I'm actually the founder and president of the Muslim Student Association here on the medical campus. So we just founded that last year. And so far, I'd say that it's, uh, it's been a successful, successful turn of, uh, of events. I mean, it started pretty much from nothing, and now we've seen it turn 
and to at least open discussions and some type of mutual respect and understanding between the, the various student organizations and things like that. Uh, over the course of the past year or so, uh, since the organization has been founded, we've done a variety of things. So we've held biannual dental screenings that have been free for the community. We've distributed about 2,000 dental kits to the underprivileged communities in Boston, from soup kitchens to homeless shelters. Uh, we've held various uh, cultural and social events, uh, ranging from iftar dinners during Ramadan and all of the likes of these. So, and I've managed to, to do these things with, obviously, the, the help of a team and the help of colleagues and friends and professors. So I couldn't have done that alone. And I'm coming from New Jersey. So I'm, uh, I was born in Egypt uh, originally, but all of my education was in New Jersey. So I'm a graduate of Rutgers University in New Jersey and just coming here for dental school. So I'm not close to hitting a, a decade mark or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. So thank you all so much, and I encourage everyone to kind of ask any questions that uh, you've been holding back. I mean, this is the opportunity for it. So uh, any questions are obviously welcome and, and encouraged. Thank you guys again. Can we give them a warm round of applause? Thank, thank you very much, folks. Uh, I, I don't know where to begin, but uh, Amir, perhaps with you, because uh, you were the last one to speak. I'm going to come this <laughs> way it, now. Okay. What's the deal with uh, how, how you feel, you as a Muslim and, and your fellow Muslims are represented in comparison to other faiths here on the medical campus? Well, I mean, so as I mentioned before, uh, when I first entered the, the dental school here, and coming from New Jersey, it has a very diverse population in general. So a lot of different religious groups and cultural groups are very well represented there. And when I first started dental school here a few years ago, I noticed that there was no type of, of involvement for the, the Muslim students as a whole. And I noticed that there was a Christian Medical and Dental Association. There was Alpha Omega. So there were other organizations that were representative of other student organizations and faiths and cultural groups, but there was none of that existent for Muslims on campus. And that's not to say that we can't assimilate and get along with all of these different groups without a student organization, but I just felt that it was important for us to have a, a standing or a, a say on campus. And I mean, it ranges from various things. So like I mentioned before, we were able to give back to the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community. So we really managed to do a, quite a, a great deal of things for the community. And also we gave back, obviously, to Muslim students as well. We developed a prayer area within the dental school that a lot of students now from the various campuses use and utilize. Uh, so we've done a variety of things. So I found that it was very important coming here and establishing that presence uh, so we can have conversations like these with uh, a standing or with some type of reputation behind it. So how do you feel it is now? I feel that it's much better. I mean, I feel that right now just our ability and our opportunity to have this type of discussion says enough about our, our presence on campus. So even in the course of a year or two years, I feel that we've, we've come a long way uh, just, just by having this discussion here today. Sharuk, how, how do you, what can you say regarding uh, how, the, how the university as a whole or the medical campus addresses uh, Islamic issues, Muslims, websites, comments, emails, things like that? Uh, I mean, I think uh, in the university itself, so you have to understand that Muslims, there's only what, one, uh, about 7 million Muslims in the United States, and uh, most of them, a lot of them, don't live in Boston. Uh, so I think our basic population is reasonable over here in Boston. I think a lot of people who are Muslim are in other non medical professions, probably. There's a, you'll see a, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, CEOs, you'll come across IT personnel, finance personnel. Uh, healthcare, I think, there's, there's, there's a certain amount, but you can probably know them. Uh, so uh, there are people in basic sciences that is increasing, but at the university, I think it, it depends on who, who applies and who comes here. Uh, but I personally have never felt any uh, any ways to hold me back, you know, or uh, or or felt uh, any any problems in that. Obviously, the, the more folks we see who apply to the uh, to the university and uh, and come, uh, you'll see a greater thing. But having said that, been here since 1992, I think things. Uh, are good. I mean, even on the undergrad campus, you have uh, a prayer area. We always had that. Even in the medical school, we used to do a prayer area on the basement uh, of this building, or the first floor of this building. So, so there's there's areas in there. Depends on how much you get involved. Uh, but I think my my colleagues have been great. I think uh, the university but, but, has been great. But you, you think there might be some Islamophobia, though, among those that surround you, especially in social media. 
Yeah, so I think that's that that is a new thing that has probably developed over uh, the last year. Social media, obviously, Facebook, Twitter, and all that, uh, and with obviously the presidential campaigns that are going on, uh, you do find that pe- folks that you may be working with, uh, they know you, they know what Muslims are, and yet they either go along with blanket Islamophobic statements or they'll just put up their own statements. And I think if someone in the university setting in the academic world knows about Muslims and they know how we interact, and I'm assuming I, I'm a good person uh, to everyone, uh, they can always take the opportunity to come out and chat with you and say, hey, you know, I heard this. Is this legitimate? Should I share this on my feed? And that hurts. You know, when someone you know uh, that that you know really well for years and years and then they start and suddenly start sharing what's going on, on on there, it really hurts that you've spent a lot of time and, and, and commitment and uh, that this is what's happening. So I don't know. So, Sadi, I don't know if you, you feel that way, or Ali, or you know any of the other panelists. But but that's a new thing. I think it's social media, mostly with the presidential elections going on, that this is happening. Yeah. Um, so I want to just uh, maybe say something which is different, a little bit because I come actually from Europe, and um, I want to say that uh, things are completely different in Europe. Um, I've been in uh, campus for 12 years, and uh, there is no way for any Muslim to go to the dean or to any person in the university and say, listen, I'm a Muslim, I want to just, to, I want to just uh, space to pray. So as I came to this country, the first thing I realized that my chairman in radiology was Muslim. And I look at him one day, I remember that, the 1st of January, when I started, I said, listen, uh, there is a Juma. how are we gonna just do? Are we going somewhere? He said, no, 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 the dean gave us the first floor here in this building. And I said, I was like very surprised. I spent actually my entire existence in Europe and Africa, and I've been always dreaming about something like this. We can actually really do something without hiding. So that's actually really a very important point here for everyone here uh, as American, maybe didn't travel or didn't know about this, is in Europe you do things hiding. And maybe most of the problem that happening in Europe is from that, because they want people really to hide and to do things in hiding. So on the other hand, I agree with Sharouk when uh, it comes to someone who's put, putting something on internet or posting something or uh, Facebook or whatever that you know very well, it really hurt. It really hurts very much. And I found actually my department and my section, um, I don't know, maybe because I'm a chief, so people will just, you know, they don't want to talk to me openly, or maybe because I'm actually very open. My residents, they talk to me. I mean, I, I was having a discussion yesterday after work with one of them, and they asked me, like, literally, what do you think about this? I do think you're a nice guy. I don't see really Muslim doing this if they are Muslim. And so I had the chance to explain to him, to explain actually with some verses of Quran, because you have to demonstrate things, otherwise, you know, if you take it out actually of context, you can say anything else. But I explained to him in a way that it's very friendly, of course, no actually screaming nothing, because I do think people has the right, when they see what's happening right now, to also uh, question things that are maybe, for me, can hurt, but I do think when they do it face, in, uh, face to face, it's way better. And I understand that feeling. And I can maybe correct it. And I said, listen, at the end, I'm a Muslim, I'm acting like you. Uh, you know, if uh, there are a few Muslims that are not good, they may be actually not well educated, they go actually a little bit crazy, but when you see educated people, they can talk like you and I without screaming on each other. We can explain things like I explain radiology to you, I can explain also Islam a little bit in a way that, of course, I don't want to just do it every day, but if you ask me, I will do it. Absolutely. In a friendly way, in a, fr- in a, in a way that you understand and I understand. We can continue that, that, that discussion. But, Ali, just, just to uh, close uh, your comments, but do you think, though, that from your viewpoint, that Muslims are fairly treated here and that they have the same opportunities as everyone else, or are there impediments? What do you think? Um, I really think, you know, this is really very personal, as I said. I do think that I'm way more than fairly treated. I'm actually like you, like anybody here. I've never heard someone actually saying something to me wrong. And I do, most of the time, I do think most of the people that I know sometimes they said I'm Muslim, they, they get like, you know, are you really Muslim? I say, yeah, I'm a Muslim. I'm actually, you know, practicing Muslim. And 
any time I was, I mean, actually, when, it, when you take it from academic, academic um, uh, work, when I came here, the first thing I asked, you know, my chair, I said, listen, I came to this country for a purpose. And this is very honest from myself. I came here to be a professor. Because in France, I was told that I cannot be a professor. And I asked why. They said, we don't, I mean, Obviously, we, don't, we cannot answer the question. Yeah. So you understand the full story behind. So I said, if I cannot be here, I promised my father, quit in Tunisia, that I will be a professor one day. So I came to this country to be a professor. I've done everything possible. And when I asked Alex Norbash, I said, I don't want you to tell me what is my salary going to be. You can ask him. I've never asked about my salary. I said, I work, but tell me what is the purpose of me being a professor. He said, you have to publish every year four papers as first author. After how, ma how, how many years? He said, two years and a half. I was appointed as a professor after two years and three months. That's what happened. Of course, I worked hard, and Dr. Antman here can tell you about that. But what I'm saying by this is that you work in this country, to be honest, it's the best country for opportunities. There are problems here. Of course, we know the problems. There are politics that maybe sometimes it's not really the way we want it. But from the opportunities point of view, this is the best country in the world. I know that. I'm from Africa. I went to Europe. I am here in America. I know three continents. I speak three languages. I, I did everything step by step. This is the country. If you want to just really thrive. And so myself, I've never found anything here. And I, I will maybe even add something. I'm maybe scared outside today about my family, about other people that surround me by you know, being a Muslim, maybe outside, but inside the university here, I feel absolutely safe. And even people, I heard people talking about me and actually saying, that's a good guy. Muslims are absolutely different. You know, they can be different. They can, they, you can have a good Muslim, you can have good Christian and Jewish, and vice versa, etc. And as a matter of fact, one of my colleagues here sitting in front of me right now, she actually so many times said so many good things about me as a Muslim and, you know, uh, took actually but, let, that as a difference. Let me ask uh, Sadia, because she may have a completely uh, perspective as a woman. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of misconceptions and misunderstandings out there. So if you can follow up with what uh, Dr. Gurmasi was saying, uh, how do you see it and what can we do to... Uh, address the many misconceptions and misunderstandings that are out there here. There's some here on our campus too. But. Well, I would say that I agree with what everyone has said so far. I feel you, that, I have, no? Wait, get it closer, yeah. that I have been very fairly treated here. I feel that I do have the right to open speech and that's really important to me because I also went to school in Europe and I do agree with Dr. Hazi that um, you do things more in hiding over there as opposed to the U.S. And as he said, I might feel some sentiments, negative sentiments outside in the public, but uh, thankfully not at work. And even if it is what someone said at work, it's mostly on social media or it's a blanket statement. It has nothing to do with me personally, which is what I don't understand. And yes, being a Muslim woman does come with its own set of challenges, but I feel everybody faces those challenges, every woman does. And all the associations that they've mentioned on campus, the Muslim women, the Muslim associations, have been helping those misperceptions. If anyone has any questions about that, they can ask me. Well, what do you think are the major stereotypes out there regarding Muslim women? I think one of the big stereotypes is that they do not work which is not true, that they're forbidden from working. That is absolutely not true. They can choose to work, and they can work in whatever professions they choose. Well, we have some difficulty finding mm -hmm. a woman to join the panel. So, yes, in the OR, I didn't realize this, but I am the only Muslim female in the <laughs> OR. But that's a little unique. But if you do go, for example, to the dental school, you'll see a lot of Muslim women there. You'll see a lot of them in internal medicine, pediatricians. I invited a friend here. Um, but yes, they are underrepresented. But as Dr. Jalisi said, there are only 7 million Muslims in America. Thank so you. that doesn't...
qualify for everybody there. Mm-hmm. Can, sure. I, can I just add something very quickly? So in the sure. dental school, there's actually a, a floor, the second floor. Everyone only talks in Arabic. Literally everyone on the floor it just speaks Arabic. It's like the common language that even the professors started to pick up on the Arabic and started to talk back. But uh, touching back on the question about the, the fairness at the university, I noticed that when we were starting the organization in general, uh, starting it, like I said, from, from the ground up, I noticed that I received the same exact treatment as all of the other student organizations, whether in terms of room bookings, whether I was trying to set up uh, elections for the board, whatever types of events or requests we were being being we were, we were asking from student affairs, we were granted all of them and more. I mean, especially since we were coming in as a new organization, we really needed a lot of support and continued assistance from all of these people that were really helping us out, faculty, staff, uh, other students, other members on campus. So I found that we found an overwhelming amount of, of support when, when we were starting it. And uh, that kind of is indicative of the, the status of how Muslims are in general on, on campus. Can I just add one thing to uh, what Ali said? So it's important for people to take away over here that not all Muslims speak Arabic. I do not speak Arabic. So, <laughs> it's a very diverse, diverse religion, and uh, uh, comes from all walks of life, a- anywhere in the world. And uh, so that's very important to understand that you know not all Arabs speak. Uh, uh, I mean, all Muslims there's, speak. There's Arabic. people who don't speak wanna, Arabic on the second floor it. too, by the way. So yeah. there's there's English also. I promise it's not just <laughs> Arabic. So I, I want to maybe add also something. I do think. Here, everybody would know about this because we are educated, but not also every Arab is a Muslim. Yeah. So there are so many other actually Arabs. There are Jewish Arabs. There are also, um, you know, a, uh, a Christian. Of course, all the Middle East, and there are also in the Arab countries uh, people that are Muslims, but not also Arab, but in the Arab countries. For example, my wife is Berber has nothing to do with Arabic. I have no clue what they, what they are saying in family. They just treat me very badly because they love each other. She is from Algeria. Seven million, they are Berber in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Chad, etc. They are all, that area is Berber, like the Kurdish. They are in some Arab words, but you know, Arab countries, but they are still not speaking actually Arabs as can, well. Can you be, I have people that emailed me thanking me for the invitation uh, and they phrased it something to the tune of although I am a Muslim I am an atheist how do you reconcile that is that possible does that exist in the spectrum of of, 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 of Muslims <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so um, the, the reality if you said I am a Muslim already you are actually not atheist anymore but what he wanted to say is he was born as a Muslim from a Muslim family but now he doesn't actually you know, believe in anything. Like right. one, someone who, uh, you know, was born Christian, and, and he can say, I'm Christian. But if he said, I'm Christian, he's, he's not atheist. But atheist, Christian, it means that he was born Christian, but no, he doesn't believe in anything. So, well, let, let me switch gears for a second, because every time I turn the television on, there's something going on impacting Muslims. Somebody's saying, don't let the Muslims in, or... Uh, just today, right, in L.A., they closed uh, the schools. I don't know what ended up happening there, but, you know, the thought of terrorism crossed my mind. Uh, uh, there's so many events that are assigned to uh, uh, Muslim extremists and so on and so forth that, that it's almost inescapable today, turning the radio on, opening a newspaper, watching television. It's, it's, it's very pervasive. So are you folks, uh, are you folks a bit uh, concerned uh, a bit afraid? Uh, have, have you changed uh, the way you act and interact and go about your business? You already said that this is a pretty safe environment, but how about outside, you know, and what, what can we do locally to impact the greater, uh, you know, atmosphere, if you will? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Any, Con- anyone, yeah. So the, the first question was addressing concern. Are we, con- <clears throat> are we concerned, I guess, was the main question. I mean, to be honest, I'm just as concerned as everyone else in the, in the crowd, to be perfectly honest. And when I turn on the news and I notice something like that or a shooting, I pray myself that the name doesn't come up Muslim. And I'm telling you, I'm com- being completely honest as a Muslim sitting up here today, that I pray and pray until the facts are released that that name doesn't end up being Muslim. And that's not because I... I don't understand my faith or I know what my faith preaches, that's besides the the point. I know my faith preaches peace and doesn't tolerate violence and terrorism, but I know that there's a lot of people out there who are getting their their information from that news, from that media outlet, that once that name becomes Muslim, 
it represents, it brings a whole different definition to Islam as a whole. And what we can do to, to combat that, I guess, was the second part of the question. And I would honestly say more discussions like these. So, I mean, these, these discussions or just asking a Muslim in general, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that don't even know that I'm Muslim. And I'm sure people up here are the same exact way. Um, if, if a Muslim is, isn't covered or doesn't wear the hijab or have a long beard, that doesn't mean that this person isn't Muslim. So there's a lot of people out there that I'm sure that each and every single one of us knows that is a practicing Muslim. Just because that isn't, isn't personified or doesn't come off straight off the bat doesn't mean that they're not Muslim. So just engage in questions or even your curiosity or why do you do this or why do you pray five times a day? Just simple questions like that can lead to a mutual understanding and that also develops into mutual respect for one another, for one another's cultures, one another's religions. And I think that's very, very important and that's really the, the stepping stone to understanding one another. And that's, I think, how to combat it locally, at least on a, on a local level. What do you say, folks? Okay. So, I, uh, uh, so Rafael, you bring up a very important point that there is uh, extremism out there, and uh, uh, we hear about most of the extremist attacks uh, coming out of the Muslim world or or Muslims associated with it. So we have to accept that fact, that there is this. Uh, but most of the extremism and, and its victims have actually been Muslims. Uh, so that's very important to understand that in Pakistan alone, uh, extremist attacks have killed uh, 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 over a million, uh, or over 500,000 people have been killed in various attacks. The most recent, we just uh, had a vigil in Harvard Square over the weekend. 143 children. Uh, 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 elementary and middle school children were killed brutally by these extremists in Pakistan. Uh, there was no media coverage in the United States for that. Uh, but, you know, these people get, get in and they, and they do stuff. So it affects the mainstream uh, Muslim's life, which is uh, what we worry about over here. When you go out, you worry about, and as Ali said, you wish, you know, this is not a Muslim name out there, or for my situation, I hope it's not a Pakistani background person. Uh, because, you know, we love America. I mean, I, I, I'm American first, and then Muslim is part of my uh, life. Uh, but suddenly to uh, be uh, weighed in the same uh, scale as these uh, crazy lunatics, I call them, who I, I don't even think profess the religion. The religion is about peace, and the religion says you kill one person, it's like killing the whole um, humanity. Uh, and that upsets you, you know, but you're already upset at what these people are doing, and then suddenly you come under this uh, magnifying glass uh, that, oh, you're a Muslim, hence you must be with these guys. That, that, that to me is nutty. And I think that's why Ali is right, is ask questions. Uh, ask that person if you know, hey, uh, what's up with this? Uh, in the United States, uh, you know, 2% uh, uh, of, uh, of terrorist attacks have been done by Islamists uh, or call themselves so, Muslim. So, sorry to interject, but the, the issue is that there is such sensitivity that I just gave the example at the beginning. Uh, that you have medical students in their fourth year that they've known each other and they are reluctant, they, they, they are uh, fearful that they might ask such a sensitive question such as, are you a Muslim? So mm -hmm. is there something that Muslims can do to kind of uh, 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 make people not have to ask that question, yeah. I guess. I think it's to be open, you know, I mean... Uh, but, but it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's a personal preference, right? I mean, it's a personal preference. Like, uh, we celebrate uh, Ramadan and Eid, and uh, Ken Grunfeld, my chairman, has come to my house for, uh, to break the fast. But I think, uh, I think that the, the Muslim community themselves are to blame for being closed up and not celebrating uh, uh, Muslim life. Uh, but I think as time goes on, I think it's, it's a cycle that every minority group goes through, that you go through the cycle, you're in a cocoon, and then ultimately you start opening up so people know about it. And I think that's part of the problem is the fear of the unknown. What, what, do these, what does this community stand for? So I think we have to blame ourselves about it too. That, and I think there's more understanding now. People are going to be more open with everything's going on. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's what I can say. I mean, it's uh, us to blame I, I as appreciate well. it. I'm going to let Ali make a brief comment, and then we're going to open it to questions from the audience. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, I do think there are two faults. To, the, uh, to, to your question. One of them is right now, what we should do. So I do think the media, as you can see, it's um, also to blame a little bit because what's happening is every single event is just propagated how, how many times, amplified. But if you tell them there is um, Sharouh Jalisi who is actually uh, doing a great job actually um, every day, 
saving lives, etc. Nobody would be interested to put it on CNN or Fox News. So that, that's actually one problem. But I don't know how to reverse that at this point because it's all about money and uh, probably actually business. Uh, but from our side as well, we need actually probably to go and outreach. And uh, that's something that I've never understood until three years ago when I started really uh, doing this work with my family. We're outreaching everywhere. And I do think every single family here in the U.S. should go for this outreach, explain actually to neighbors, explain actually to people around, etc. And that's how you educate people. Unfortunately, um, uh, as Sharukh said, we are only 7 million. And uh, unfortunately, we're not represented in all states. There are Muslims only in 13 states, believe it or not. Other states are just individual people. Now, the second thing is really the long term. And to be honest, there is a number that every night when I go to bed, it gives me fever, it gives me headache, everything you want. Is that out of the 1.7 billion Muslims, the education is about maybe a 1 or 2 percent. And when I said education is real education, real opportunities, when education can prove to bring you to somewhere else, that should be changed. So when you go to any country in the Arab Muslim country, you don't, you don't say, oh, I want to sit here. I love Tunisia, my country of birth, but I, I don't want to go back. And I will guess if everybody is here, I will ask any Muslim here if want to just go back to his country of birth. Why that? Why this is? This question should be answered in long term. So this is the long term. We need actually to educate our own population to understand that this is not the way to go outside. This is not the way to express yourself. There are maybe some um, inheritance of injustice, but it's the way is to discuss this. It's not to go and explode yourself because this is jihad. And as my father explained to me so many times, and I want to just really, uh, because I have the opportunity, everybody listen to every day to the TV, radio, and say jihad. But let me say something, because I'm an Arab and I understand what is jihad about. Jihad, I do it every day. I do jihad every day. You know what is jihad? Is when you try to find a way to not harm any person, to not say anything which is wrong to someone. What we call jihad nafs, it's actually the fighting against yourself. Yourself, because you're gonna do something wrong. When I see Kent, actually, uh, who is actually chair of ENT, I see him almost every day. I say, hi, how are you? And I smile. That's easy jihad, because I'm giving him the best welcome every single day in the morning when I see him. That is a jihad. A jihad is not to kill someone. It's not to go outside and kind of crazy, insane, and do harm to other people. Jihad is when I want to just say something wrong to someone, and I don't do it. I said, no, I should not. I should behave you know, otherwise. That is the jihad. Not the jihad that are you know, explaining to us every day on TV. That's the wrong one. This is really something I want to just explain because so many people don't, don't understand it. And my, 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 my father, since I was young, used to tell me this. You have to behave. That is the jihad. Thank you. Thank you. And folks, uh, in the green. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for that question. Uh, 
So I think from a religious literacy in an academic institution, I think you can do it in several ways. Uh, one is obviously you have forums like this where we're sitting here, we're talking about uh, right now it's Islam, it could be Judaism, it could be Christianity, it could be Hinduism, whatever it is, you can, you, you can do that. And I think all of us learn about different people. Uh, long term, obviously, you could probably incorporate it into a, a medical curriculum or residency curriculum or whatever it is. But you bring an important point that our patients are of diverse backgrounds and not only do we have to understand their their ethnicity, but also their religious background. So that, that, that's really what, what I, can, I, I can suggest. I don't know, Sadia, from a resident perspective, or what, what do you think? That's a very important topic. No, I agree. It's, imp- it's a really important topic. I think it should be built into a residency program as well because we do deal with a diverse group of patients, and it does make a difference how you treat them. I've had lots of patients as an anesthesiologist tell me they're scared to death before going in for surgery, So, and their religion is very important to them. So if they want us to say a prayer, we should be educated and be able to do that for them and what they need because we are providers. And I think we should be able to discuss it openly if we need to have not just panel discussions, but possibly little meetings within the residents or within um, the medical students in little groups and discuss that. Appreciate that question. Yes. Can I just touch very, very quickly? So also the opportunity that for these student organizations on campus is very important as well. Um, even these events that we have, whether it's during Ramadan or during all these various events, I think it's an opportunity to even capture a little bit or a glimpse of what that holiday stands for or what this specific prayer means or what this specific word means. So I think even as small or as little events as we have throughout the course of the year as a Muslim Student Association, I think it's important. So if if students are interested in finding out more about the religion, more about the culture, meeting more Muslim students or faculty or professors, I mean, they have the opportunity to do so uh, through uh, a means such as a student organization. So I think that's also an important reason that we do have a a stance on the the campus as a whole. Thank you. Sorry if I could, you guys. No, 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 you're fine. Yes. Uh, uh, I just have a a somewhat related question. I'm a a provider of a primary care doctor here. And I think my concern is for our patients. I feel like this is a really frightening time for our Muslim patients. And I I want to, I'm hoping there's ways we can make them feel safer or let them know whatever resources we have to help them. I don't know if there are little things we can do even in our office interactions with them or, you know, bigger ideas to make the patients feel safer. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I do think um, it's, it's a little bit tricky question in the sense that some of the patients that are Muslims, they usually, um, sometimes they don't want to just, you know, say it. But if by any chance you find out uh, actually a, a person or a patient is a Muslim and he or she will tell you about that, maybe the first thing that you can say, I would, I would say it's very easy, is we, you know, we are here to serve you, etc. You can say salam, which is peace. It's an easy, actually, word just to put them on in stage and you know have them actually really, uh, you know, um, just I would say, uh, you know, can talk to you very, very easily. But um, at the same time, um, I do think patients that are coming to your office and they are Muslim, they are like any other patient. I would not, you know. Um, give them or make them actually as different as other patients. Um, the fact that you are actually you, what you are, like now, I see actually on you a very, um, you know, dedicated person, you know, happy to help, is enough. If I am actually your patient, I would be very happy to see a, a face like you, to be honest. And um, I really don't need anything. Maybe I can just, if you ask me about my background, I will tell you. If you tell me, oh, I know Islam here and there, I will be very happy, more confident. I will give you more information. I will be more relaxed with you. Um, So I do think the fact that you act with the patient in a way that is transparent and very, uh, you know, uh, uh, open, I would say, we will act the same way. Uh, As you can see, I'm absolutely the same than any patient or any person that you can actually meet, uh, otherwise, otherwise in uh, you know, in outside you know, your your business or actually in your clinical uh, clinical work and, and care. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ali. I'm just going to add to that. So I, I think the important thing right now is most Muslim families, uh, especially the middle class or the lower socioeconomic class, are worried about hate crimes. Uh, and and we, we as providers have to encourage them that, number one, they can speak up about it. A family who has four kids going to school right now is scared. Is a child going to be beaten up or killed by the time they come home? It's a real fear out there. So we, ha we as providers have to tell them there's a lot of opportunity. This is the United States of America. That's a good thing. You can go to the police. There's a lot of uh, organizations that are helping out. Uh, if they belong to a mosque, they should be really asking their mosque to be doing interfaith program. I belong to Wayland, which is a mosque, and we do a lot of interfaith with a local Jewish temple, a Christian uh, a church, and we got really good uh, letter from the rabbi at our local local mosque. And they, the Jewish community has been the largest supporter of, of, of the Islamic community right now, which, which, is, uh, which is great, and we really appreciate that. But for these people, you have to tell them that if there's any hate crime, they should be reported. Uh, there is uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations, which has uh, a Massachusetts uh, department now in Newton uh, that is taking any kind of hate crimes, and, and they can help. Uh, so, and there's a Mass, uh, Massachusetts Muslim Defense League that goes after hate crimes. So, there's a lot of organizations that they can go to uh, if they're worried about it. But we as providers just need to tell them, hey, it's going to be okay. There's a lot of resources. If you feel uneasy, go to the police, because hate crimes are taken very seriously by the police, especially if there's actual harm done. So that's very important. Thank you. There was a question back there. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to direct this to Sharuk because I know. Okay. But I'm curious as to where, in a professional relationship, where religion fits in. I don't ask my students what their religion is. If somebody's wearing a large star of David, I know they're probably Jewish. If they're wearing a large cross, if they're wearing a hijab. But I've known Shuru for I don't know how long, and I, I know he's from Pakistan because I said, where is your name from? I'm curious. I, I never knew you were Muslim until I saw it on the list here. Where does that fit into our profession? Not our caregiving relationships. That's, that's different, and I, I get that. But our professional relationships with our students and our colleagues. And so that's my question to all of you. But I direct it to Sharuk because I can. So, 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 thank you, Susan, for that. But, but I, I don't think it fits in anywhere in a professional way because I, I, it, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter if I'm Muslim, I'm Jewish, I'm Christian. It doesn't matter. It, you, I'm a good human being. The bottom line becomes is hopefully now that you find out that I am a Muslim and hopefully we've had good interactions, you will add two and two together and say, okay, what I'm seeing on TV is not what Sharuk is. That's what I'm hoping. You know, that's what we all hope is we lead an exemplary life that when you find out it can affect your, your, your thought process, or it does not give me, make me less of a person in front of your eyes. And that's what's happening right now. In the people you know uh, who suddenly start going on, on, on internet or TV and stuff like that, suddenly start questioning you, are, are you a good person? You know? And that, that's really what I believe is hateful. It's, it's, it's really, uh, really depressing. That, you, know, you, you know me for X many years, and suddenly I've become a bad person because of what's happening in the world under my religion's name. Religion should really have nothing between, uh, between a professional exchange. To me, it doesn't matter. And that's the greatness of the United States. I mean, this kind of extremism exists in third world countries. In Pakistan, I got, uh, there's a whole Ahmadi community, right, uh, which is being totally out Casted in Pakistan, which I think is crazy. I mean, the people, uh, these are hardworking entrepreneurs who are doing really well, and I think this kind of nonsense happens more in third world countries. It shouldn't happen in the United States. That's why, I mean, I, cho I chose the United States a as a home, because, you know, it's tolerant, it's a melting pot, people come here from all over the world, and you are not weighed by what your religious uh, decree is, or what your religious affiliation is, but you as a human being and a hard worker. That's what I believe in. So I hope I answered your question. In the back, I'm sorry. Can, can, can you tell us where you're coming from? So I was on a Chantal campus at BU for 11 years, and after I was a little bit younger, you would have recognized me as a Muslim because I was, although I was raised as a Muslim from birth, I was born in my faith, and so whether we cover or don't cover is a personal choice, but you would have recognized me because 
I was just a regular you know, girl. Um, so I started going, um, I did move over to this campus a year ago, and I was trying to do part of pharmacology. And um, it was based off my qualifications and how I impressed them with my interview. So I was out you know, in the world of corporate trying to find a job, and I was shut down because of my scarf that I started wearing. Now I don't wear it like most of my jammies do, so I'm still working on covering myself, you know, covering myself, but it's more than yeah, okay. So, um, so I appreciate me, you in, in that extent, and that we do have prayer rolls, and so I appreciate um, everything that's been done for this um, Muslim student community. So I, I appreciate that with you and the faculty and staff and everything that we've been trying to represent this month. Thank you for that. So just a few statements. Um, some of the misconceptions about Muslims with Muslim women, first of all, is that we are oppressed, and that's just a section of the Middle East religion. I mean, we're thinking, it was laid down in our Quran and by our prophet. That's another thing I want to touch on really, really quickly. But if that women have their own money, they can keep their own name, they can be business entrepreneurs. So we are not supposed to be oppressed. And these people say you can't drive or, 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 or we're going to stone you for adultery, which is, you know, a sin that should be a sin in every religion. But, you know, that's between us and our creator, as it should be. Um, so all those abuses should not happen. And, and, and um, another thing is that a prophet is a, a pedophile. That one thing I just want to get out to the audience and you know the public that that is not true. Um, his wife was pledged to him as a youngster, as a as a youngster, but she, they, they did not possibly have marriage until many years later. And and so that's just something I want to talk about real quick. Um, another thing. I, well, well, I, I'm I'm sorry to interject. As I said at the beginning, now hold on for a second. We could spend, I mean, you can get a PhD on Islamic studies. And I, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 One, make one point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing is that Muslims are not allowed to have sex with other people. It, but hold on, it, let me interject. It is not, but it comes across as if it were, because they are doing it. They are doing it in the name of Islam. So for for so for non-Muslims, for for non-Muslims, you have no choice but to wonder what's going on. Sure. And that's why we're having the conversation. Sure. Yep. Uh, let, 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 let me let. Please comment on that. No, uh, I mean that's what we said. So uh, I mean, if you get a, if you go actually to analysis and you see these guys that are doing, you know, the terrorist, you will find out. For example, the last one in France, the five people they were actually drug dealers. They've never been in a, you know Muslims forever. And the f three four last years they went to uh, Syria. They got completely uh, brainwashed and they came back and they've done what they've done. So they have no clue about Islam. Because I can tell you something else. I was born in an Arab country, as I said. I actually read the Quran from the first day, and still now I go back home and look at, at you know, at, at uh, the signification, etc. I'm still learning about Quran and Islam, so it's not easy to become Muslim and know everything about it. And again, that's uh, maybe another subject. But what I'm saying by this, um, why we are here, because this is happening. And we want to just actually really, you know, the people that are here, not Muslim, we want them to ask th this question, and I'm very happy to answer. And I do think that there is a mis mis misperception, yes. Uh, media is not helping as yes, but it's also our, our task as well to go to get out, to go out, reach out, and say this is what Islam is about. Yeah. This is oh, me. Oh. I am actually a normal person, you know, and I'm Muslim. Hold on, Ali. I didn't mean to cut you off, I'm sorry, but I did want to steer the conversation away from theology and studies of religion and that kind of stuff because it, that's too, too thick of a topic. Uh, so forgive me for that. Uh, no, ma'am. Um, yeah. So, thank you for talking to you and having this form. Just give you a little bit of background. I was born and raised in Milan, American country. I am Sikh, and so as you may or may not know, a lot of times hate crimes Thank you. 
One more. Thank you so much. What department Perfect. are you from? Can I can I comment? What? Ah, very good. Can one I sec- comment, Rafael? Just one second. Quick. What, yeah. When I started, I said I'm safe inside. I'm, sa- uh, you know, not safe outside. That is reality. I've been living here for 14 years. I've never thought that one day I'm gonna teach my kids. It happened uh, three weeks ago, and my wife is here. Can tell you about this. I called my two kids, 11:13. I said, listen, the time changed. You're going to actually the school. Be careful. And I found myself, by the way, completely incompetent when I'm gonna to, uh, get to, to, to myself to my kids from my mouth. So I suggested that I talk to my wife and I said, listen, the best scenario is if someone who is young, he will come to you, he said, you're a Muslim terrorist, don't even answer. You tell me or you go to actually the teacher. If an adult guy will come to you and said, you're a terrorist because you're Muslim, then you say thank you very much with a big smile and you go see actually the teacher or you tell me as well. Don't even answer the guy. Don't get into discussion with him at all. And again, that was like, you know, my best, my best actually scenario, but I don't know if it's right or wrong. So you're right, you're saying. But the aim of this is really to outreach you guys. You are not Muslim. So you will be actually our advocate outside. We are normal people, as you can see. Let me, let, please, sir. You know, I, I forgot to ask you folks that whenever you uh, take uh, the floor, state where you're from, sure. what department, you know, what you do here. And- My name is Rodney Karam, I'm a second year medical student. Um, Thank you. And so I have a comment slash question about kind of using, uh, I guess, white privilege to, to change people's perspectives. For me, I'm white male, so it's something that I think I can personally. Um, and so my comment is that
that are not at the end of the um, And then my question is then, if we're expecting you know, Muslims to, to speak up and talk about this extremism and, and to defend their faith, why aren't we as, as white people um, expected to, to you know, speak up and make the same um, arguments against white extremism, which is still a very real thing. Um, so I so to comment to that is uh, from a French newspaper today, Le Monde. They said, I mean, exactly the same thing. It's all political because you are majority, we are minority. And it's always very good and very nice and very, very happy event to scapegoat those minorities. And today it happened to, to be, uh, you know, Muslims. Um, but next day it will be something else, by the way. And the fear of this is that we have this, we have this meeting, and everybody is understanding. The fear is tomorrow is going to happen another terrorist attack somewhere in Europe or America. Because it's happening every day in the Arab world. Today, you know, they killed actually so many in Egypt. Nobody hear about it. 13, 13 of November, before, one day before, died 200-something in Lebanon. Nobody even heard about it. So remember, this is happening every day. So the reality is actually minority in the majority. The majority dictate what they want to just do. That's actually the answer of Le Monde. I'm not even telling you what I think, but it's reality. Yamina. Yamina Hassan. My name is Yamina Hassan. I'm a nurse, and I've been here for many, many, many years. Um, when I started here back in the 70s, in the 70s, I took fast. We were not from that. And you know, everybody was like, you're going to die. You're going to get afraid of you. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I invite them to my home for the eat, they come out and have a good time. You know, and so you have to as Muslims we have to open up. And I am pledging my my time and whatever I can do to educate anybody. I am affiliated with quite a few of the mosques around and I can get to the dead to the Imam, to get the education we need, you know, just to observe what we do on um, and after the So can, let, 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 me, just, uh, let me give one comment. When we started, okay. I said mm. the same thing. But you, no, remember, in America, we are hold all lucky. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sure. Ali, go. I, 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 go. I just wanted to say one thing. So uh, sure. I just wanted to kind of touch back on Brian, is it right? What Brian was saying, how, why aren't we expected, I guess, to, to defend ourselves if we're white privilege or whatever the, the, the quote was exactly. I mean, for us as Muslims being a, a minority, uh, oftentimes what's in our minds, especially nowadays with the current events, is that you might be the only Muslim that this person ever meets. So literally, I might be the only Muslim that you ever meet in your entire lifetime. And that's just a reality of how it is, especially in cities and states where uh, Muslim populations aren't that high and the number isn't that high. I might be the only Muslim that you ever know and you ever meet. So we really have, whether it's an opportunity or whether it's a burden on our shoulders, however you want to take it, to really represent the name of Islam as a whole. So we really have one shot, I guess you can say, and oftentimes it's that one person that's representing the religion as a whole. Whereas um, for Americans or Caucasians or whatever it may be, there's, there's a lot more, I guess, of a sample size, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Uh, I know that's not the most politically accurate term, but there's more, more people to represent that, or that yeah, faith, or that culture, that ethnicity, whereas Muslims are kind of representing a whole faith in that one small interaction. Excellent. I'm sorry. One is that we are great in academic circles and having these conversations, but it doesn't get outside of academia. So if people want to make a difference, they need to tweet, they need to 
And, and they need to visit the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. <laughs> 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 you should have a letter writing campaign to all the local newspapers. That's one thing. Two, no, I've never felt discriminated against. In fact, I've had an opportunity to get the President of the United States because I've led a nationwide um, enrollment campaign for the Affordable Care Act um, and, and under a Muslim organization. Um, the other thing I would like to say is, as a provider, I'd say that we should be thinking about cultural competence for everybody, whether it should be gay or LGBT. Or, or white, you know, and, and uh, feeling like I'm so, I feel so guilty about what, everything that's going on. And we should be addressing anxiety in everybody because the Muslim may be feeling anxiety about what has happened in the past, but a lot of the hate crimes are also uh, uh, driven by people who are feeling anxiety. They feel attacked and so they go on the offensive. So I think it's, we need to underscore that every human being, our, our psychology is ultimately the same. And whether you're Muslim and we're Christian or atheist or Muslim and now atheist, whatever it is, there's as much diversity, and you just have to look at every individual and connect on a human level and you know, uh, practice cultural competence with every patient. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Uh, two last questions from the lady in the front and then from, from Hernan. And then uh, after those questions are asked, uh, we're going to have some snacks in the Evan Seminar room. For those of you that might be hungry, ma'am, please. Okay. Linda Barnes, um, family medicine, but also uh, I direct the medical anthropology program here on campus. And each year I teach a course called the Cultural, on this campus, Cultural Formation of the Clinician. And it's around having conversations about unexamined biases, the ways in which we each internalize things from the media, from people we know. Um, the blind spots that lead people to, who may directly be very welcoming, but then in the next breath may tweet something or may say something in clinic, and it doesn't occur to them that they, those things collide. So I was curious, just as people have asked what they can do to support patients, I wondered if you had stories of things you have observed where people without being aware of it have, not maybe to you, but in commenting about a patient or in the way they responded to a patient, and inside you might have gone, oh, that's going to turn that patient away. I'm assuming it wasn't deliberate, but I think sometimes it can be helpful to hear stories about things that might have unintended consequences because people weren't aware. So I. I think in the clinical uh, arena at this point in time, I, I don't think religious things have come up, but mostly, I mean, you might have might hear about, you know, uh, sexual orientation or color and stuff like that. So, but I think this may be the next step that may be coming our way, you know, religiously if someone declares it or not. A lot of people don't declare what the religion is. I mean, if you look at the face sheet of our patients, usually it says unknown. Uh, so, you know. It, it, but it may become more evident as Muslims expand themselves or, or not. Uh, but I have not seen anyone target a patient or or or, or anyone else based on uh, on their religion um, at this point in time. I don't know, Sadia. I wouldn't it? say that they've directly targeted me. However, being a Muslim female, I've had a very good friend here who I really like, and we hang out. Yet she's completely fine with me on her Facebook page. It's just filled with things about women being oppressed in Islam or just about what Muslims have done around the world, and it doesn't differentiate, and it doesn't come across in her personality at all. And that's just what's so scary. And one of our co-residents is very sweet, but unfortunately, it's such a Trump fan, and he agrees blindly with whatever he says, but it doesn't come across in when he talks to me. I want to be respectful of your time. So the last question is from Dr. Hara. And we're going to make a special allowance for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, here, go first. Okay. Uh, first, as a note of introduction, I'm uh, from, originally from Chile. I'm Jewish. I carry Israel in my heart. Um, I also carry all my uh, Muslim friends in my heart. One of the major diagnoses that I haven't seen is the one of uh, collective mental illness that the world is experiencing and the anxiety of that thing. 
to know people. So my question is whether the mental health community is trying to look for solutions to this problem in the sense of helping patients, students, faculty, and the population at large. I believe that uh, that's a... Did you hear that, David? <laughs> David Henderson? No? You, you couldn't hear the question? All right, uh, uh, Hernan is posing the question about collective mental illness. And uh, you wanted to know what we could do to address? Yes, how to identify, how to say it out loud. Yeah. The reality, the world every so many decades go to periods in which the world is here. And, All right. And there are some things Okay, so, so, so Hernan wants to know how, how we address uh, this period that we're in uh, that he's describing as one of mental illness. I kind of agree with you, Hernan. Uh, um, I, I do think, Hernan, I don't know if you want to just actually talk about politics worldwide. Uh, my suggestion is there is no leader today that is at the level of what we saw before. And this is political, actually, of course, discussion. No, I'm not political. Okay, so from I, I do think there will be there will be actually people that are having problems, etc. And I, I can say myself because uh, someone asked about the question if some uh, something happened to you in front of you for a patient. I was at a, a big meeting, the RSNA. Uh, this is a meeting in in Chicago. Eighty thousand people will come every year, doctors and actually other other uh, uh, you know technicians, etc. And a guy. We were actually 38 uh, sitting actually around table and having dinner. And a guy looked at me. He said, Ali, may I ask you a question in front of everybody? I said, go ahead. He said, so what you think you can do for this ISIS to stop doing actually this, what they are doing? He said, actually, uh, a good word, by the way, in French. And I said, uh, in my mind, I said, what am I going to answer this guy? Am I responsible for this guy? I said, listen, you know what? They have a next meeting. It's happening in a week. I'm going to tell them to calm down a little bit, to not do any, any, you know. But then I went to the guy. I called him. I said, listen, it's very, very big sarcasm in France. It, it works like this. I brought the guy outside. I said, this is really a very bad question. Because if you said, we are going to do something because it's collective, it's international, there is no difference between you and I. We're getting actually the same problem. Even actually as a Muslim, I got it three times because that's what's happening. I get it once because I don't want a terrorism to happen, once, because I'm a human being and I'm a, I don't want this to happen. Second, because they're going to look at me because my name is Ali and I'm Muslim Arab. That's the second one. And third, maybe it happened in my country, and that's what happened in Tunisia so many times now. We are in a big problem, issues that happening you don't even imagine. The country went from the best country in Africa the leader in Africa to maybe the worst country right now, maybe, you know, the worst being Libya, but maybe before, before, before the worst. So that's what's happening. This is all happening to me every day because I have still my entire family. I'm the only one outside the country, outside of Tunisia. So this is actually the problem. I agree with you that people, they don't actually measure what they are saying, and sometimes it's really hurting. The last question is from the lady with the hijab. <laughs> Over just 
Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Office of Diversity, I want to thank the audience and the panelists for a wonderful conversation. We have some snacks in the Evans Seminar Room right outside. Take a left and then another left and there's something to eat. Thank you so much.